Uh, so I'm Ebert Upton, uh, and I'm one of the founders of Raspberry Pi. My father's an English uh, professor, um, and at the time he was working in Birmingham. So I was about, this is going to be about 1981, 1982, and he was working at the University of Birmingham uh, on a dialect project. And they had uh, access to a mini computer at the university uh, that they used for a bunch of their data automation. Um, and he took me in one day to have a go on it. Uh, and they had a game called Hunt the Wampus, which I know lots of people have played, right, where you have this grid of rooms and you can hear this wampus and you can fire arrows. Um, and I think in this version, the arrows, it was a three by three by three cave. Uh, and the arrows, they go off one side and they come back on the other side. And if you, so if you, if you fired an arrow and then stood still for three moves, you'd shoot yourself. Uh, and I remember, yeah, the, so the very, very first thing I ever did was, with a computer as a three-year-old was to shoot myself with an arrow uh, in Hunt the Wampus. So the first computer I got was, the first computer I owned that I bought was a BBC Micro. My, uh, my dad had borrowed a Commodore 64 uh, that I'd had a little play with, uh, just on the level of just hitting keys on it. And then I had a cousin who had a Spectrum and then a Commodore 64. Um, and we had, a, we had a machine at home, I think 1986, my, my father's publishers bought him a, a, an Apricot Zen, uh, which is this kind of pseudo PC compatible uh, um, 186, no, probably 8088 machine, I think. Really awful, terrible machine. Uh, but it had a little, uh, it had a keyboard with a little LCD um, display, it had function key, it had the regular function keys, and it had six function keys which had an LCD display above it, so you could have labeled, um, software labeled function keys. Um, this was really useful for the, the uh, kind of technical word processing package he was using, and it ran um, GW Basic, came with a version of GW Basic. So I think I, I wrote a bunch of, I wrote a bunch of GW Basic code on that. I had a BBC, access to a BBC Micro at school, so it was kind of dual language, GW Basic, BBC Basic. Um, and then in 1988, I finally, Saved up enough money, 220 pounds. Um, bought a second-hand BBC Micro uh, from a, uh, went into Tesco's, and it was one of the, the classified ads on the board in Tesco's. So I wanted 240 pounds for a BBC Micro uh, with an 80, uh, 4080 um, floppy disk. Um, and I went and bought it, offered him 220, thought about it for a bit, longest two days of my life, uh, and, I, and I got it. And it was, it turned out it was a Model A, so it was a BBC Micro Model A that had been upgraded to, partially upgraded to Model B. So it had started off with the 16K of RAM. It had the extra RAM put in. I think they put the printer port in, but they hadn't put in, and they put maybe a printer and joystick port in because the A was very depopulated. Um, it didn't have a user port populated at the time, but I got this machine, and one of the RAM chips was slightly dud. So there was a little, if you put it into a high-res graphics display, there'd be a little kind of barcode on the screen. And if you edited too large a document in, in WordWise, then you'd, there were known places in the document where you'd get character corruption. So when I did my schoolwork on it, um, I used to have to go through and I used to know basically which pages I had to go over and then correct with Biro after I'd, uh, um, after I'd, after I'd printed it out. But it was, a it was a lovely machine. I subsequently put the user port in there. Um, and yeah, I got, I guess, four years, probably pretty much exactly four years of use out of it. Um, I was really lucky I chose the BBC Micro, so I'd, obviously I'd come across them at school. I mean, that's where most people, I guess, kind of met, their BBC, met the BBC Micro first. Um, I, I wasn't really that fussed, um, and I looked at some, I remember going, I think Atari had done some deal to unload, what, 800XLs or something at Dixon's? And there were really, there was a lot of other stuff I could have, they, they were kicking around, they looked very attractive from a price point of view. But I was really lucky I went for the Beeb, obviously, because there was the, the library had books about it. So all of that documentation was available. Um, and so yeah, dumb luck, I guess. There was always this thing, I mean, I'm not sure if this is a real thing, right? But um, it was almost like there was a class thing. Because you see Spectrum ST people, and you see BBC Amiga people. And I was a BBC Amiga guy, uh, on a spectrum, and because the difference is about 100 pounds, of, is about 100 pounds in each of those tiers. Um, uh, but I was always, I was like a, I was a BBC Amiga guy on, um, on a uh, um, spectrum ST budget. Um, so I, I, I got my BBC second hand, and my, and my Amiga, which I've got today, uh, which I've got with me today, was, was shop soiled. It was a shop soiled Amiga 600 at the point where they were about to introduce the 1200. So I was always able to kind of eke out the slightly higher performance machine out of the kind of basically 200 pound budget that I had. So I probably properly got into it um, when I was about nine and I had a friend, 
who had an acorn electron and he could write little games on it and I was infuriated that he could write better. he could write games and I couldn't and this whole this whole, this whole thing the whole subsequent 30 years is all about beating Martin Brown <laughs> so I yeah and he had his he had his electron I had the beef at school and yeah I was just just wanted I always wanted to write games I remember the, one of the very very early games I wrote was a kind of a, a straight yeah, into the into the screen car racing, sort of a bit like overdrive, sort of straight into the screen car racing thing with this big kind of car made out of um, made out of VU twenty three user defined sprites. They would clunk 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 along the bottom and this road that would come past, you know, it's um, terrible. I was reading a lot of stuff in micro user, uh, and all of the exciting stuff in micro user was about the wimps, the wimp stuff on on uh, on the Archimedes. And I, I was thinking, oh, it'd be great to write a Windows system for the BBC. This was beyond my capabilities, but I thought it'd be great to write a Windows system. And so obviously I'm going to need a mouse. So I upgraded the B, bought the mouse, um, and the mouse turns up in this box, this little box like that. It's just a mouse. That's all it is with a cable that plugs into the user port. There's nothing else. Um, and my dad phoned up. Uh, Watford Electronics and complained and he said, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, and the guy at Watford Electronics, the customer service guy at Watford Electronics said, if your son can't write a mouse driver, he doesn't deserve a mouse. It was like 1988, you know, <laughs> it's 1989 maybe, I don't know, it's incredible. Um, and uh, it was a pretty typical Watford Electronics customer service, I think. But I wrote a mouse driver, I learned to write, that was my first piece of, uh, first piece of 6502 assembler, first interrupt service routine. Uh, and yeah, I, I did two. I did, I did two versions. I did a um, a, a polling one, uh, you know, and then I did a, a proper interrupt driven one. So the polling one, basically, the mouse would just move at a, at a single rate across the uh, um, across the screen, and the um, the, the the the, I, the ISR one was proper proportional mouse movement. I never got. I never actually got round to writing a, a GUI, but I did have a beautiful mouse point. There wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of formal instruction. In, in computing as uh, in the 1980s. We kind of look back on the 1980s as being this kind of golden age, but actually we had no real, uh, what we had were, were computers at school that you could play around on and you, you might bump into a teacher in a, on both of both my middle and my um, uh, high school, both had um, somebody there who was interested uh, and, and could kind of help you along, give you a, your own account on the network. You know, my middle school used to have, we had about 12, we had four years each with three, classes in them. So you've got 12 classes and there were 12 accounts in RM Nimbus network. And there were 12 accounts, there were 13 accounts because there were 12 accounts for the class and an account for me. And there was usually an account for me after I'd broken out of the, after I'd broken out of some sandbox, usually to get myself access to a copy of basic, one version of basic or another. Um, there would be a, okay, right, please stop doing that. If we give you an account, will you stop breaking, <laughs> will you stop doing that? Will you stop teaching other people how to break out of the sandbox? Right? Um, and so it was that kind of thing where you'd have a teacher who would be helpful. Um, to you, but yeah, no, no real fault. I think we had some logo as part of um, GCSE maths. I think we had some logo, but by that time it was, it was. I, I was a long way past logo by then. So yeah, Mr. Mr. Stewart at my middle school um, is a science teacher, and Mr. Wright at my at my um, secondary school, um, and yeah, they were they were really really helpful. And understanding, right? Because it would be possible a less enlightened person might scream and tear their hair out, right? When they find somebody like like breaking into various bits of the network. But it was always done with good. It was always done not to break stuff. It was always done to figure figure things out. So I think I got away with it. And my mom was a teacher at the secondary school as well, so I might have counted for something. We used to. I used to build little things with my dad. I used to build um, like a little bedside light, reading light. You know, with a. It was. Um, you used to get those four and a half volt three cell batteries, the ones with little um, kind of metal tabs on them. Uh, it had one of those uh, light switch, you know, a wall, light switch, spare wall, uh, 240 volt light switch, um, and then a, a little uh, bulb in a bulb holder. You know, used to, I, so I used to build those sorts of things with my dad, and my dad's one of these kind of ha quite handy guys who, you know, he comes from a, that, that generation where car maintenance was a thing that human beings did. Um, and uh, so, yeah, he's always been quite handy, but yeah, no, there's never been any sort of in my immediate family, never been anyone who's really done tech stuff. I mean, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were very supportive, but this wasn't something that, uh, you know, I, uh, th this wasn't something that came down from above. This was something that I did. And this was sort of like at school. It was about having things you wanted to do and being allowed to do them, not having people not stop you rather than people actually, you know, doing it for you or helping you do it. So I was a, I was a, um, I was a year ahead at school, um, and I, I, I couldn't come to Cambridge immediately. Um, and so I, I shopped around for places to do a, a gap year. 
the two places I applied to were Data Connection in Enfield, uh, who turned me down, um, and uh, which is fun because I spent some time hanging out with Chris Mayers from the, uh, from MetaSwitch, and it's always nice to remind him that they they turned me down. But and, and IBM in Warwick, uh, and IBM. So IBM for probably uh, fifteen or twenty years up to that point had had an amazing pre-university um, uh, program. Um, and run by a guy called Ian Nussi, who's one of these. You, do you know Ian Nussi? No, he's one of these guys in a certain, there's a certain circle where if you say to people, do you know Ian? They go, oh, Ian, yes, I know Ian. And he'd, he was running a software engineering group called the Warwick Development Group um, of about 15 people in, in Warwick, uh, but was sort of a, an IBM grandee. Uh, and ran the pre about 50 or 60 person pre-university program that he populated mostly with Oxbridge, uh, people going to Oxbridge, um, or, or some of the kind of more engineering focused um, um, Russell Group universities. Um, and I went along for an interview there, and he asked me, he, uh, he asked me this question, um, and it was, it was, you take a sphere, right, and you drill a hole down one axis of the sphere, like it can bead, right? And obviously, the, the why do you make the hole? The, the, the flatter, the, the, the thinner the bit of remaining material gets because you're chopping kind of a cap off at the pole. So eventually, if you drill, drill a large enough hole, you get something like that, right? You know, with curved outer surfaces and a flat inner surface. Right? Um, and the question was, if you do this and you make the drill, the drill wide enough that what's left is three centimeters tall, that that distance there between my fingers is three centimeters, what's the volume of the, the, the remaining material? Um, and he asked me this, I mean, it's really, it's a difficult question. It's, it's, well, it's a great, great interview question because it's got, kind of got two ways of answering it, right? Um, the, the simple way of answering it is to say, well, you haven't told me the diameter of the sphere. And because you've not told me the diameter of the sphere, it's got to be one of these ones that turns out not to depend on the diameter of the sphere. So let's go for a three centimeter diameter sphere. So the hole is infinitely thin. And then it's just the volume of a three centimeter diameter sphere, right? That's the smart ass way of answering it. The difficult way, the, 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 the way that I tend to answer these sorts of things is to go do the maths. <laughs> and he asked me this question and he got a long involved phone call from Paris pretty much immediately, from some colleague in Paris pretty much immediately after he'd asked me the question. And I went and sat there and he was on the phone for 20 minutes. And I sat there filling pieces of paper with integration. <laughs> At the end of it, I told him the answer. I think I got it wrong, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, he gave me a job. So, and that that was really interesting because I met a lot of people there who kind of um, shaped the rest of my, you know, sort of my early life in in, in my early adult life in, in computing. I met um, Mark Longer, who was um, who was the first employee at my first startup and was our best man. Um, I met um, uh, Graham Sanderson, who's a very good friend of mine, who uh, who then moved to America and he his consulting firm in America then gave me he he left to work for IBM in America, pretty much immediately quit and started a consulting firm. And I used to go out to Austin in my summers um, and, and, and work with Graham. Um, so I met lots of people and lots of them in my first startup kind of grew out of some work that the two of us, the two of us did together. Um, so, so that turned out to be a really good turn. Getting turned down by Data Connection is probably the single, the single best thing that's ever happened to me in, 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 my, uh, in my professional life. Um, but yeah, so the, the IBM thing was great. And then a real shame that he, he then, it was really towards the end of Ian's reign as king of PUEs, and then he stopped doing it and it became a much less good program thereafter. My sister went through it four years after me, didn't have any fun. And then uh, went to St. John's, went to St. John's College at Cambridge. And I met a guy, actually when I, um, I was waiting to meet my tutor um, and on the, my first day, and there was another guy sitting on the sofa there, a guy called Alex Evans. Um, who's now runs Media Molecule, right? so the guy who invented Sackboy. Um, and it turned out I'd sat down with the only other guy, really, who was interested in programming for fun um, in, my, in my year. Um, and, um, yeah, we, we, we got to be friends. And we never, I guess we never did any real serious programming together, but we used to hang out. Uh, and I used to just admire the completely insane, awesome stuff that he was doing. Um, and, uh, but he'd been to Westminster School. Uh, and Liz was a couple of years uh, ahead of him, uh, and then she, but she came up the year after us, and I was going, leaving his room, I think. I was leaving his room, it was up this spiral staircase, and I was leaving his room, and Liz was going to his room, and we bumped into each other on, on the stairs of uh, East Staircase New Court um, at, in, um, what, October, November of 1997, my second year, Liz's first year, um, and... Uh, yeah, that was it. 
<laughs> been stuck with her ever since. It's wonderful. Um, and we, with the lovely thing is because I still, I still, we still walk through John's a lot sometimes. Um, we park out the back and walk, walk down into town on a Saturday, and we walk through. And we get to walk through that staircase. What was that first person? It brought me terrifying. Actually, I've not met anybody else at university quite like it. I, I was a law student, and um, they, were not like it. they all used to they all used to dress properly, and yeah. uh, and they didn't have shaved heads, and uh, yeah, not a lot of shaven-headed law students at Cambridge. So, uh, um, but you were in a white shirt. That's what I remember. You were wearing a white t-shirt and a black leather jacket. Yes. It's dressed like a fascist. That's what yeah. I was say. <laughs> Brilliant. So you even owe your relationship from then on? To uh, then oh, it, took us about, it took us about a year. Right. It took us about a year, but uh, we, we, got, we got there in the end. But <laughs> November 5th, 1998, a day which will live in infamy. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Liz. Um, so yeah, so I came up in 96, I did two years of physics, uh, and then I did a year of engineering, and then I dropped out of my fourth year of engineering to, to run IdeaWorks. Um, really hard. Really, really hard, actually. I found, I found being an undergraduate very difficult. Um, I, I, didn't know how to, I didn't know how to work. I didn't know how to study. I found school very easy. Um, I perhaps with being at IBM for a year had fallen off the wagon a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, certainly your maths degrades. I think it's when they, they suggest math. people who are doing proper maths, not, not maths for physics, the kind of Mickey Mouse maths that I did, but real maths. Uh, they recommend they don't take a year off because you need that kind of continuous pace. Um, so yeah, I didn't know how to study and it was the first thing I'd ever done which was hard. Um, and I got, when I get, I got a fairly middling 2-1 in my first year, which is a real shock. I got a third in uh, one of my papers um, and um, scraped a first in the second year. Um, and then uh, a 2 1 of some sort, and I never looked. I never dared look. Because if I got a 2 1 in, the, in, my, in my, my final year, because uh, something kept distracting me, I can't imagine what it was. Uh, running idea works, that was it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and because I started IdeaWorks when I was when I was in my was in my you know, in my second year, um, and um, yeah, I, I I got a two one, and I've never looked. I could, could have got my mark, and it was either going to be a bad two one, in which case I'd feel bad, or a, a, a nearly a first, in which case I'd feel bad. So it seemed like I never. I just all I know is I got that is I got a two one, and then I in that summer, um, IdeaWorks really started to become very successful. We'd we'd um, we'd made a big sale to Intel. Uh, we'd sold a bunch of Java I'd written to Intel, um, and it was started to become real. And I um, I dropped out, so I didn't go back. Um, at the time, you could do. I think this isn't the case anymore. At the time, the four year course, you could quit after three years and do a bachelor's. So I kind of got a bachelor's um, in 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 the bank. Uh, and I quit, and I remember going to my dad and saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try and defer. And he thought this was a very bad idea. Um, I had a, a difficult conversation, um, and I deferred. And the, the college wasn't able to decide whether I should be allowed to defer quickly enough for me to be able to safely defer. So in the end, I deferred, and I only found out at Christmas that I'd been allowed to defer. So I could just be walking away from it all. Um, I ran IdeaWorks for a year. Um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and this was at the point where we were still. So IdeaWorks was um, started doing pluginless 3D graphics for the web in Flash and Java, and then eventually became and is still uh, a mobile games company. Uh, it's uh, still running today. Um, and so this was in that first kind of bit where we were doing pluginless 3D graphics, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and then I, I thought I'd come back. I, I thought I'd come back, but I, um, I'd had a number of friends drop out who hadn't really enjoyed the fourth year of engineering. So I came back to read uh, computer science. So I came back to the, the diploma, which is now the now defunct um, diploma in computer, in computer science. Originally, I think the diploma in numerical methods and mathematical analysis. I mean, the oldest, the oldest taught course in, in uh, computer science in the UK, loads of people have done that course. It's really worth going back and looking at the people who, uh, who, who did that course. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And that was kind of like my kind of swerve away from engineering to computer science. But I came back, I did that, I then did a PhD, um, and then I then did an MBA. And I've now been in, uh, informed that I am not allowed to do any more. <laughs> so, um, and I agree, with the, I agree with the decision. 
it is it is the right decision. So, um, but yeah, so I so I sort of kind of had this kind of like three years of in summary, two years of physics, one year of engineering, dropped out, came back, did computer science diploma, did the PhD. That was why. And then a few years later, the MBA. But yeah, I have a love hate relationship with Cambridge. I, whenever I'm there, I find it very hard. Yeah, psychologically very difficult because it's it's. Um, and I have learned to study subsequently, but um, I've always found it very, very difficult, very tough. Uh, I remember getting through my, uh, I had a term of my second year where I got through, I had a packet of Haliborange, you know, little, little um, vitamins that come in, the 60, 60 pack of Haliborange and three cards of five by four of these little orange pills. Um, and I had a nine week term, 63 days. And this was a year when I did well. You know, I got a, got, a, got a first in my, in my second year. And I got through that second term, the winter term. I got through the second, that, that winter term by thinking when I finish this pack, I can go home. Yeah. So then sort of working at the computer lab. Yeah. So I moved into the, the, the computer lab in Cambridge used to be in the middle of town. Uh, so it used to be on the new museum site, these gar what were then ghastly buildings on the new museum site, they've now clad and made a little more pretty, but they were in this, this kind of warren of rooms there. Um, that's where the Trojan Room uh, um, coffee pot was. Um, and the Gates Foundation built us a nice new building out, at, out in West Cambridge, and they'd moved in. So I was finishing the diploma, I was finishing the diploma in the summer of 2001, uh, and the computer lab was getting ready to move into the William Gates building. Um, and um, at the last minute, I decided I want to do a PhD. Um, and I got some funding from the Computer Lab Supporters Club um, and uh, went from expecting to spend the next few years running IdeaWorks to negotiating to sell my shares in IdeaWorks and starting a PhD inside of about three weeks. Um, and yeah, I, I was, at the, was at the Computer Lab for uh, four and a half years. Yeah, about four and a half years. Uh, four years at the computer lab, and then they throw you out. They make your life a bit, they decide if you're not submitting your PhD in a timely fashion, they make your life steadily less cushy. You know, first of all, you, you have your office, and then you have to share an office, and then you don't have an office. Uh, and at that point, you really, it's like being in the club and they turn the lights on and off. You know, you, you know that they, it's, it's, it's time to submit your PhD. Um, but yeah, I did that. I was, um, I was director of studies. So after two years, um, Gavin Beerman, who'd been the director of studies at St. John's, left. Um, and uh, they asked me if I'd like to do it. Uh, and I did it for, I did that for two, the last two years of my PhD and then the first, my first year at uh, Broadcom. Um, I, was, I was director of studies. And that's fantastic because you're hanging out with undergraduates who were really, really, really clever um, and trying to stay ahead of them, you know, trying to teach you've got these amazingly bright kids and you're actually trying to teach them something, you know, you're trying to make sure that you, you have enough of a lead over them. So, you're, uh, so that, was, that was a lot of fun. Um, and I met some, you know, met, uh, met interviewed, admitted, taught, um, so really some of the brightest, some of the brightest people I've, I've ever met. And it's kind of a, it's an enduring source of disappointment to me that I don't have any of those people working for me at Raspberry Pi. My, by and large, what I've done with Raspberry Pi is to go out and go through my address book and just mine most of the, the talent you know, get most of the people who I who I know and respect, uh, and it's kind of disappointing I've not managed to get any of those any of those people in. But there were some amazing people. Stories, Stories from the computer lab. Um, Morrison the lift. Oh yeah, there was Morrison the lift. I don't know if anyone don't know if anyone's ever heard the story of Morrison the lift. So so while I was so Morris Wilkes, um, he of Ed Sack and being awesome fame, uh, he's a, he was a Jonian. Um, and um, I had a chance to have dinner with him a few times at various sort of college events. And really interesting, really interesting bloke. Um, and he had um, been given an office at the AT&T, previously Olivetti, then AT&T lab that um, Andy was running. Um, and they'd, they'd, I had a friend, Rob Haig, who was working there, who'd done, a, done a, year, a year's internship there. And he said that they'd set the lift doors, they had a, a lift, and they'd set the lift doors to be very slow closing because Morris was there and they didn't want him to like get trapped in the lift doors. And 
um, this was incredibly annoying for everybody else in the building. And there was a there was a switch, like a reset switch inside the lift. And if you what you could do is get into the lift actually and like hit this, you know, sort of fireman switch or something, and you could hit the switch and it would close the doors and you know sort of override the, the delay. Um, and he got into the lift one day and he was just about to um, uh, flick the switch and he saw uh, Morris come around the corner about ten yards away with this stick. You know, he's going to be about ninety. Come around with his stick. Uh, and he sees that the lift's about to go, picks up his stick, runs down the corridor <laughs> into the lift, and then flicks the switch. Because <laughs> he's been finding it annoying too. But yeah, Morris was it, was, it was kind of cool. It was overlapping just with, with, with Morris and with um, David Wheeler as well, who was, you know, uh, invented the subroutine on, on, on EdTech. Um, so it was kind of nice that I was there just at the time when they, these people were still around and still still available to talk to. Still, you know, we I used to have coffee with David Wheeler on. You know, we had the um, the lab still has has this thing called um, a happy hour on um, Friday afternoons where they'll get a keg of Milton keg of beer from Milton Brewery and everyone will sit around and play chess and go uh, backgammon uh, and eat crisps and drink beer. And yeah, so you know, I just sort of get to drink beer with uh, um, with, with David, which is kind of kind of funny. He's a great guy. Uh, and that was the, 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 the happy hour thing, which is still going on. It's kind of weird because I used to play a lot of chess. I, used to say I spent my first year of my PhD mostly drinking coffee and playing chess. Um, and the weird thing about there is there's, this, there's a caste system, right, of the people who play chess are like the thick kids, right? You know, the, the clever kids play Go. You know, the guys who are basically mathematicians, they all play Go. And then, the, you know, those of us who are kind of like, you know, engineers with grease on our hands and stuff, you know, we play chess. <laughs> but some good chess players at the computer lab. Um, I joined Broadcom because I had a friend called Neil Johnson who'd been my office mate for the first two years of my PhD and he'd, he'd gone to um, Cambridge Consultants when he graduated um, and uh, he, so he went to Cambridge Consultants and he was always going on at me about how great Cambridge Consultants was and how I should join and then he went to Broadcom and started going on about how great Broadcom was and how I should join and what I didn't realise of course is there's an employee referral bonus uh, and so he wasn't entirely, uh, yeah, he, he wasn't entirely on my side there. Um, and it's, it's, it was a good bit of money as well. It was like two or three grand, right? Um, and so I went to shut him up and I went along in, pretty much bang on 10 years ago. So I went along in, uh, in to an open evening in, in March in 2016, handed my, March of 2006, rather, uh, and handed him my, my details and they got in touch with me and I was sort of standoffish and I didn't want to show up. Um, and then on my birthday, so 5th of April uh, 2006, I went along just because it was kind of embarrassing, right, to have given your details in and then to be kind of blowing them off the whole time. And I went in and I turned up. I was working at 4QD. I was been soldering motor controllers together and I had kind of basically kind of workman's clothes on because I was all covered in solder flux and, and stuff, an old T-shirt, an old ripped T-shirt. And I turned up for this interview. Um, and the first person I met was a guy called Simon Long who, who now works for me at... Uh, um, at uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, um, and uh, I met this series of people over the course of the day, and by the end of it, I was just desperate for them to call me because they were that clever. You know, they were some of the cleverest people I've ever met. There was Simon Long, Ross Oldfield, uh, Steve Allen, um, uh, Peter Derivas. Um, so uh, Simon now works for me. Uh, you know, Ross is a good friend. Um, uh, Steve's kind of like wandered off, um, but. Uh, Peter DeRiva still does, he works for a, a consulting company now in Cambridge and does stuff for Raspberry Pi every now and then. So he did a lot of our H.265 support on Pi was written by Peter. So you see people, another one of these things where a bit like IBM, kind of you end up, that, that first group of people you meet are very, very influential in your life. And I was just desperate for them to call me. I, I really, really wanted to, really wanted the job. And because I'd had the discussion about, about term salary and stuff, um, uh, before I was sold on it, I'd actually negotiated a really good deal, and so my, my joining package was, was was pretty good. And I looked at it against doing more freelance work, which is what, what had kind of been the plan. And I was like, well, you know, I can I can make as much money working for Broadcom, um, and I can hang out with these awesome people. So so I did. I was never going to be an academic. Uh, I don't have the brain for it. I don't have that. There's a thing you need to have to be an academic, right? You know, there's a particular kind of aptitude. And the, uh, the kind of focus on publications is just not something that I can do. I wasn't good at grinding out publications. And I was never going to be a successful academic. And um, so I 
I mean, that's what a PhD is, right? It's a kind of an, it's an apprenticeship for, for academics, and you get a chance to find out. They get a chance to find out if you're any good, and you get a chance to find out if the lifestyle suits you. And I think the answer was probably no on both on both counts. So I was always going to go and do some stuff. I'd already started and sold a business. I was always get, always going to go and do something like that. Um, but it was it was certainly a surprise to find myself working for a big American Fortune 500 company.